Hey everyone, so I've been wanting to put out something for a while about YouTube censorship, the topics of ivermectin and vaccines, and particularly how much has been centred around Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast, which has had several videos taken down and censored, has had both their channels demonetized. So I've been working on it for quite a while, mainly trying to get key people in dialogue with each other. Also, we just put out a newsletter on it a few days ago about the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. But in the meantime, things have been moving. For example, this article yesterday in Quillette, which was co-authored by Yuri Dagin, who's an independent researcher we've had on this channel, Brett has had on his channel, who did a lot to uncover evidence about the lab leak hypothesis. Partly why I haven't put anything out on the channel is that it's actually very, very complex. The free speech censorship dimension is pretty clear, that the social media platform shouldn't be censoring good faith discussions, but the marketplace of ideas is broken at a much deeper level than that. So the following film is a conversation we just had in the Rebel Wisdom digital campfire, where I try and kind of dig into as many of the different threads as I can, respond to a few questions, and also a dialogue with a couple of other friends who've been looking at this as well. So I hope this is a useful framing. What's fascinating about this topic and this story is all of the issues with the information ecology that we've been talking about, the problems of sense making, come into really sharp contrast. And also I feel I haven't talked about it on the channel yet. I've been working quite hard on various angles of this. I've been looking at different medical figures, researching it. I haven't put anything out. I think I also feel that absence on the channel. Like I haven't put out anything. Uh, I put out something on Twitter, basically saying that I disagreed with the censorship. So I'll start by saying, I'll probably talk for, 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 for a while first, and then we'll go into a bit of dialogue, and then we'll go to questions and more of an open conversation towards the end. But, I, but part of this is also um, to, to try and explain what I'm making of things with what I've been able to put together so far, but also why this is such a complicated situation. Um, and part of that is because this dynamic almost always falls into the free speech censorship issue, this sort of binary of free speech and censorship. And I think that's really not a helpful frame to look at this, even though I would fully agree that it's not up to the tech platforms to decide what we should and shouldn't talk about. I can't actually come down on a completely sort of free speech absolutist position on that. And I think if you do, you haven't really understood like how dark things can get online. There are, for example, communities of people, Facebook groups that advise um, parents with kids with autism to feed them bleach. And if and when the obvious happens and they start coming out in all sorts of rashes and have all those problems, like, oh, that's just the toxins coming out. And so Facebook shuts down those groups. It censors that content. I'm making that point to say that I think there is a line. I don't think that Brett's content crosses it. I think that we need to be able to talk about things like ivermectin and vaccines, partly because you can't gatekeep that kind of conversation out anymore. And I think, I don't know how many people read the, the, the newsletter we put out recently where I, we tried to kind of go in a little bit more depth than is often possible on YouTube and talk about the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. That for me is the key issue that we're dealing with is that we have these alternative claims that are not being checked because they're basically turning up on podcasts where there's no incentive structure to challenge them. And then we have a mainstream that won't platform those perspectives for fear of false equivalence. And we've just got this massive gap in the middle where it's awfully difficult to find out what's true and to evaluate truth claims. And that for me is the, the central question and the central issue that I've been trying to deal with is, can we create on Rebel Wisdom a place where we can bring together, for example, Pierre Corey, the, the sort of prime advocate for Eva Mectin, alongside someone who disagrees with his read of the evidence and let people hear, hear it for themselves. So I'm just going to quickly summarize why this, why now? Because yesterday, Quillette put out uh, an article about Brett's content that was written by or co-written by Yuri Dagan. Yuri Dagan, we recently had on Rebel Wisdom as one of the researchers in the lab leak theory. So he is uh, a Russian, a Canadian Russian medical entrepreneur who was 
one of the, the researchers in, in Drastic, the collective that did so much to uncover the lab leak. I think he's been on Brett's podcast talking about the lab leak. So this was quite close to home. And it's also quite close to home that Quillette, which has been kind of described as the in-house magazine of the intellectual dark web, also published this quite very strong criticism of, of Brett and Brett's content. The, the real concern I have at the moment is that what we're seeing is a further kind of fragmenting of the information ecology, particularly in the kind of heterodox space, because we're not seeing these narratives coming together in any way. And I think this piece by Yuri, where I think they said something like, we have every right to be appalled by Brett's judgment and immorality, or talk, talking about a moral way. And I see so many claims of bad faith being thrown around, and some of them are justified, and some of them, I think, we're, we're all bad faith. We're all a mixture of good and bad faith at different times. We all say, we all get triggered by things. We all say that we don't mean, we say things we don't mean. One of the reasons I'm glad Josh is with, with, with us today and joined us is we've fallen out on Facebook before. Like I value Josh's um, perspective. Generally speaking, Josh is a very measured guy, but we've, we've got to the point where conversations are broken down on Facebook and we've never really had the conversation about why that was and, and cleared it. But um, one of the reasons that I'm glad Josh was able to join us is to, to perhaps model something of that in this dialogue. So I think Josh has a different view to me on some of the science and some of the perspectives around evermectin and vaccines. Um, and I guess it comes to the heart of what I think the, the problem is around sense making and why I see so few people able to, to bring the necessary levels of the perspective, the third person, the second person, the first person epistemics of the shadow work of what's being triggered in me with this, what is going on, am I being epistemically hijacked um, in an environment where we are being manipulated at all times by these platforms that are deliberately making us tribalize, making us stuck in what we already know, creating ecosystems that never talk to each other. There's obviously a huge amount of importance to the questions that are being addressed. Like these are life and death matters in many ways. And Brett has said that. I've heard him say, if people follow my advice, I know that that could lead to, to people dying. Like he, he appreciates the gravity of it, but believes certain things about the, the vaccines and about evermectin. There are ways we can judge those questions. We can look at kind of the background of these people. We can look at the evidence base. We can talk to get a sense. And this is what I've been trying to do over the last few days quite intensely and in speaking to people who I respect and getting recommendations of other people to speak to. And I've got some views around that. I'm a journalist. I'm not a medical professional. So whatever the solution to sense making is, it, it can't be the galaxy brains on their own. And it has to be some kind of collective um, collective sense-making to check ourselves and to be aware of our own biases, of which I have a, as many as anyone else. I have certain fixations. I have certain beliefs um, and histories that come into play in this as well. Joshua and Max, would you like to reflect on, on what, I, what I just said um, before we maybe dive in a little bit deeper? Sure. First of all, thanks for having us. Um, I appreciate you laying out the context where we can have more meaningful discussions about this. Uh, I read the piece in Quillette that was published yesterday, and uh, I especially like you calling out the tone of that piece. <clears throat> One of the things that I think could be most helpful in the conversation is to have ground rules about what we do and what we don't rule, what we don't do. Rule Omega has always seemed to me like the gold standard in that area. I assume many people aren't familiar with it, but it might be worth dusting off, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, or on an even simpler level, just the rule that when you smear, you lose the argument. And that was what I noticed most prominently in the Quillette piece, piece was that there were enough smears enough times that it's just, you're no longer talking about the same topic. And so uh, it feels to me like you're setting the right tone. I appreciate you having us here and I look forward to exploring more. I too appreciate the way you frame this um, because I think it's it's more than just a question of ivermectin and the vaccines per se. It's also a sort of the, the deeper question about collective sense making and how how that is done at the level of the individual and how that's sort of 
reconciled at the level of the group. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I think I've been an advocate for sort of this, these minority reports. Uh, and by the way, I'm vaccinated. So, you know, anything that I have a bias towards uh, the, the, the vaccines being safe <laughs> because they're in my body, right? So um, I, I don't want any other sort of ideological priors uh, to, to figure into this, particularly as we move forward in time and are able to gather more information. What we found ourselves in on mass, sort of on mass and, you know, at, the, at a planetary scale with this pandemic was a situation in which we had to ask the question, what is the appropriate action to take as, as people are dropping like flies? What is the appropriate action to take for specific groups as people in other groups are dropping like flies relative to other groups age-wise that are not? So you get sort of this stratification, right, by age in some of the data. Of course, there are problematic aspects of data methodology. You know, this information ecology, the, the problems with it, this post-truth era goes all the way down in sort of fractal, fract fr fractal fashion into data collection itself. You know, there are all, always problems of dropped context of different different aspects of that data collection that can be wrong. But in some crude Bayesian analysis with the clock ticking, we have to make judgments as individuals and not all of us are able to do that uh, as cognitive elites. So there is a cognitive elite out there that we have to be begin to respect. Some are better than others at statistical analysis. Some are better than others at medicine. So it's not to say that we should just trust anybody who says anything vociferously. The reason that I have been sort of, um, you know, on Brett's side in this or to say at least let's take a harder look at this is that crude Bayesianism. As, it, as we move forward in time, we had the we had no vaccines. The vaccine rollout was slow and the and the clinical trials had to take place in the meantime. Can you just explain what you mean by crude Bayesianism, Max, just for the slow sure. among, us, among me? Sure, it's an it's um kind of inference system based on the best available data, and in more or less you use the the inference of thinking in probabilities based on the the available evidence you have. That that crude Bayesianism means you don't know the unknowns, and you don't know there are other factors that may emerge in the future that are unavailable to you at that moment. But in order to make a decision at a certain time, and of course we're moving forward to, through time with this threat around us. We have to make some sort of rational decision at that moment. The process of making the rational decision at the moment means we need a level of throwing spaghetti against the wall. We need more and more minority voices, um, particularly as when we have this highly centralized, you know, deference to the CDC and WHO as the arbiters of all truth on these matters, you are, you are relying on a centralized system of of expertise and authority. And when that centralized system gets something wrong, it can be catastrophic for the system as a whole if you just assume that everybody defers to those authorities and no one questions their pronouncements. So in a decentralized or more, you know, uh, a more decentralized or at least distributed system of, of collective sense making, you get the checkers. You get the checkers of the checkers. Part of this creates a hall of mirrors, and I want to acknowledge that to you. You've You've done a great job of pointing that out. It creates a kind of hall of mirrors, a, a polluted information ecology, particularly when we enter into it with this sense that I know it and I'm going to put a finer point on it with some sort of moralism on top, as the Quillette piece did yesterday. At the same time, um, we need those checkers and the checkers of checkers in order for people to be able to make some kind of rational, crude Bayesian decision in the information ecology while the clock is ticking. We need that deference to this million radical free speech, uh, even if it includes some things that strike us as implausible. And that's kind of where I land on it. And yet I do want to, to stay on this idea that the sense-making apparatus, both individually and collectively, is, relatively, is, is br broken in a sense. This adjudicating mechanism, there's no real skin in the game. People can there's a low cost signaling apparatus that is the internet 
And there's no, there's very little punishment except to, to some extent to reputation for being wrong. And I think, um, I think this is problematic and it, I think it points to way, one of the ways that maybe in the future we'll be able to improve sense making by having people have more skin in the game relative to their claims. In the end though, where I tentatively land is let's give ivermectin a chance. We should have done it earlier. And um, I think, you know, I hope that some of the claims about the vaccine dangers are overblown and yet we need to keep looking at those, even if I'm going to end up with some form of cancer in the end. Yeah, I I want to kind of pull apart the ivermectin conversation, the vaccines conversation, because I think they're substantially different. And and while I think it's it's a very peculiar position where you've got the big tech platform censoring the ivermectin conversation, I think the vaccines is like is in a different category. And I, I also my sense is that the evidence around that is slightly more more well known as well, um, which I'll maybe come into in a second. But um, one thing that came up when you were talking, Max, is might be helpful for framing. I remember Jordan Hall in the Deep Code piece talked about the problem with centralized information is everything has to be simplified as it goes up the chain and then simplified as it goes down the chain. So you've got a, a huge amount of loss of, of context, of nuance within any centralized organization. Every layer um, of the hierarchy has to compress the information. You know, if you were out in the field seeing what's going on with, say, the rainforest insects, and you're reporting it up to somebody who's at a think tank, who's reporting it up to a policymaker, who's reporting it up to a legislative decision maker, they're having to simplify a lot to go up the chain, right? So you're losing an enormous amount of information, which means that you can only do so much. It's kind of like if you imagine, uh, remember those like in the 80s, they had those glass spheres that if you touch them, lightning bolts would touch your fingers? So the sphere is the whole thing, and the broadcast modality is one of those lightning bolts. So it kind of like maneuvers around the sphere, but it can only handle that much, and that's not a lot. And that's just the nature of the structure. Right? Just this, a structure that has that kind of geometry to it can only perceive a certain fraction from the bottom to the top. And then, by the way, the same thing happens the way down. The directives that are given from the top have to be, they, they have to be relatively simple because as they go down, there's a, an expansion of scope, which increasingly adds basically noise. Because the, new, the person down below has to add a whole bunch of specificity to what to be done. And then as it gets handed down, you get more and more noise. Um, and so the, this means at the top, the directives that come down have to be very broad and simple. And at the bottom, the divergence between what actually happens out in the world and what was intended in the top is actually quite large. And so you get a, a lack of elegance and precision, and you get a compression going up. And so this means that it has certain capacities. It can actually get us to the moon. Turns out that's a domain that's well within the scope of what it can do. It cannot solve climate. Full stop, period. Um, and there's a lot of other things it can't solve. So that's one boundary condition. So I think that, that frame for how the COVID pandemic has tested to destruction that entire centralized way of doing things is very valid. Like we need some form of decentralized, multiple, multiple different strategies being used in different areas and some way of communicating between them. And that entire way of being, as Jordan sketched out in that film, I think has been shown up to be insufficient to the task. As I said at the beginning, I'm not a medical professional. And I think the way to adjudicate these is to have people who are well steeped in each side of the, the case to have the argument. What I would do is just to respond to the bits that I that I've found in my research so far. So how, how I've tried to kind of work it out is to talk to heterodox medical voices who've been contra narrative for quite a long time. I've tried to kind of identify them. So they're not in the tank for the consensus. They don't have drug, tie, drug company ties. Was there anything that before we go on to the questions that you wanted to, to close off with, Max? Well, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's okay. I mean, th there's a fallacy called appeal to authority. Um, and, and it really means appeal to inappropriate authority. I mean, at some level, when we go to a physician, you know, we don't want to go to our, our best friend and say, hey, will you do heart surgery on me? You know, obviously, we're going to, we're going to have to appeal to authorities to some degree to, to their analyses, to their meta-analyses. We're going to have to appeal to the authorities who collected the data to begin with, which is rife often with methodological problems. So I, I, I don't 
I don't think on the question of ivermectin in particular that we can get out of this authority, authority hall of mirrors. Um, it is about ways that we balance the considerations of one set of expertise and the rationale they use, the stories they tell, the data they present, the reputation of the people involved, all of that comes together to form what we can, the best we can do, which is this crude Bayesian analysis. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I don't, and, and I do agree with Josh in the sense that um, the, the kind of gaslighting that is done, the kind of minimization that is done by journalists, not, not you, David, in, in particular, but journalists who are these fact checkers who, um, who are just engaged in these pylons of, of alternative, uh, alternative proposals for these ideas. There is a cottage industry of this stuff that's absolutely damaging and people use it as gotcha online. So you can, you're potentially spreading bad ideas or criticisms at the expense of, uh, of spreading ideas that could gain more traction with time, at the very least, giving people an opportunity to evaluate the data in a manner that what Josh is uh, saying, which is to use some sort of better rational scientific analysis, or at least counting on people uh, to trust in people who are very, very good at doing that and getting diverse set of perspectives from those elites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you point to another issue with the kind of fact checking, which is often just consensus enfor enforcing, but also it's part of the uncanny valley that anyone, and I think the most, the most dangerous part of the uncanny valley is when you start believing that anyone with any kind of credentials must be in on it in some way. I think you start to then start, you, you really then start to lose your ground. Yeah, I just wanted quickly to say that, you know, I, there's a, there's, we have to be careful about parsing fallacy, you know, use, using fallacy to for one's position. And on the other hand, looking at certain trends and patterns or dynamics of, of uh, complex systems of, of economies. And in particular, the idea that Brett has suggested in particular on his uh, podcasts has been that there is this sort of nefarious collusion like after the early convergence on vaccines as a means of doing it, there's a heavy investment. There's a suddenly a heavy investment on the part of the government in R and D on the vaccines and on distribution. So we get this, we get this collusion between the, between the state and multinational corporations that he seems to be suspicious of. If you have mm. the, and, and I think there, it, that the, these suspens these suspicions are warranted because we do know that there are dynamics of collusion, particularly when it, you know, it appears th there could have been funding and research that gave rise to the lab leak that came from, you know, U.S. taxpayers. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this early idea that this is what we're going to do. We know these these kinds of new vaccine or relatively new M mRNA vaccines work. This is going to be the plan. We got to execute the plan, stick to it faithfully, and any other thing that comes comes on board is going to be a distraction. Any other ideas, that is the way bureaucracies think. And I th and I do believe. I don't think that there's nefarious intent. There's a lot at stake, particularly on the side of the corporations. But I do think we have to be use that as a modicum of skepticism about those kinds of claims coming from those authorities. Um, not to say that that's a it's a drop dead argument. And I don't think Brett was making a, a, a sort of, you know, kill him dead argument with this idea. Um, that, unfortunate uh, choice of metaphors. there, there Max. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, is the, as the final argument against this, I think he was saying, these are reasons for us to be suspicions of convergence on this singular path when maybe what we needed is a both and. Mm. Yeah. I do want to come to Chris's question, but one thing I would say is that the narrative that the vaccines are, that there's, they're far more dangerous than we're being told, and there's a lot that uh, of adverse reactions that are not being reported. I think that suggestion with the vast commercial interests that are at play is worth investigating. What I would say is, in the conversations I've been having with the doctors I've been speaking to, one, they, they all say they were very suspicious of the vaccines when they came out. It's not like they were kind of fully on board with it when they came out. They were 
there was a lot of suspicion in the medical community about how quick the vaccines were put together. They were new technology, but they said they'd been won over by by seeing what had happened and by the data since the vaccines were brought out. So, and also that they're not, these are people, some of whom have big podcasts, some of whom have podcasts that are only really of interest to people within the medical industry. They've got contacts with medical people all over the country and they're saying, we are not seeing, we are not seeing that. We would be seeing that if there were this huge number of adverse reactions, we would be getting this signal. So that's what I would say from the sort of the, the broader perspective, from what I can make sense of so far. Um, but Agreed. sorry, Chris, we're going to come yeah. to Chris. Sorry, you, we, your, your question about ivermectin. You're going to unmute yourself and ask it. Yeah, I was just curious if, any, if the efficacy of the ivermectin was anything close to what Dr. Corey, the frontline COVID doctors, Brett, have claimed. And someone even posted after my question that Fauci has announced that they're spending $3 billion on therapeutics. Why would they not use at least some of that money to do the randomized double blind studies that are required to um, give the medical community, the NIH, CDC, the confidence in something like this for a generic drug? So I can answer that. Uh, and I, I want to be clear that in answering it, we have to go into the realm of speculation. I'm speculating about people's motives. I'm speculating about meetings that I wasn't a part of. <clears throat> we can make informed speculation, but it has a different epic, epistemic status. Uh, this, the best speculation I can come up with is uh, pharmaceutical companies are extremely wealthy. They're extremely influential in public health and medical training, funding research, influencing the FDA, the CDC, the NIH. Pharmaceutical companies have a very large impact and they have a financial incentive to prioritize drugs that are still on patents so that they can actually earn a return on their investment. And I can't blame them for that. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is just incentives. They need to return a ret- they need to earn a return on their investment. And the way they do that is by promoting drugs that are on patent. So if they have the influence, often the people who are working in public health are uh, formal medical industry and vice versa. There's a revolving door between those two. Those institutions are captured by the pharmaceutical industry. And it is those politicians and bureaucrats in public health who decide whether to fund those trials. And the truth is they don't need clinical trials to determine whether ivermectin is effective because the trials have already been run. We already have them. We could fund larger ones and they have lots of evidence that that would be a worthwhile investment of money, but they don't have the incentive to do that because there's not much money to be made on it. So I'm going to disagree with Joshua here. Um, So there are are currently 73 trials of Evermectin underway, including five very large randomized control trials. I don't know who's paying for those. I don't know if there's any US government money involved or any government money involved. Um, I spoke to, obviously, I'm very suspicious of, there was one drug, I can't, was it Remdesivir that was approved for use? Like, the influence of patented drugs and uh, that are incredibly expensive and the likelihood of them being authorized for various kind of corrupt reasons is very high. I think remdesivir is an example of that. So we've got to be suspicious about that happening. But my understanding with, with Evermectin, firstly, there are these trials underway. And then there was a lot of focus on the Oxford trial that has been underway for a while and some suspicions that that might be, I think Brett suggested that was deliberately designed to fail. I, I'm not sure that quite adds up. Um, it was because, yeah, to do with the, the criteria for being accepted onto the trial. But I think there's, there's so many trials now underway for it. I think we will get good data on it. And also, and I don't know how to evaluate this, I spoke to Yuri, and Yuri poo-pooed the, the financial arguments behind vaccines and said, these are not, these are not massive profit makers for those, for those companies. He said, if you look at how much money Pfizer is making on any given year, the amount they're making off these vaccines, he said that's not a lot of money. There's um, more than- I don't know if, I, I think it's more, I think the vaccines are definitely being pushed, but I think they're more for public health reasons. Like people have made a decision at a very high level that this is the way out of COVID. And that's what's being, like once that decision is made, it's a public health message that just gets pushed through. I don't think you necessarily need the monetary argument 
to explain why there's so much force being put behind them. But you do have to be suspicious, like, is the cost benefit analysis for using them on children good? Is the cost benefit analysis for using them on people who've already had COVID good? Those questions come into play. So I think we need to be suspicious, but but I do, yeah, my, my understanding, I, I just I just do not believe in a world that with a conspiracy vast enough to cripple all of those trials, especially if we're assuming that, especially because the argument doesn't really make sense because we're already saying like there have been trials of ivermectin that have proved that it that it works. You've already said those trials. So so I think those five trials that are underway and a lot of the trials that are underway will give us an answer one way or another. And then we'll know whether there was certainty misplaced or whether there was we whether we missed an opportunity to save thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. I think we will have an answer to that. Um, and we'll be able to kind of look back at that. Yeah, Josh, did you you had a couple of questions in the in the chat. Did you want to to make what to either roll them together or ask one now? Hi, I'm I'm just sort of contemplating if I want to speak. You just did. Yeah, I just did. Um I well, one of the things that's been interesting to me is I I just saw um an episode of uh, the Conspirituality podcast. I don't know if you've been following them, but they've been quite critical of Brett um over the last couple of months and in their most recent interview uh, their most recent podcast, they they were uh, criticizing him for us- utilizing what they called the um, the censorship megaphone, whereas by claiming that you've been censored, you actually can increase uh, your signal and your uh, your audience. And uh, I don't know. I just wanted to know if you've been following that and if if there are any thoughts around that aspect of of like has has Brett been. Um, acting responsibly in that in that regard as a source of information this is a very touchy question because it goes into motivations and it's very difficult to talk about it without um it's ad hom it's it's arguing at him as a person for his motivations in a way that i find very sort of underhanded Hmm. i don't see a way around bringing that dimension into the conversation though because audience capture is also about motivations and about the way that things warp around us. Um, I can say that I know Brett to be a good faith actor and I know Brett to be authentic and genuine in, in, in articulating his beliefs as, as well as he can. Um, I also think, I mean, to steel man his position, I think he is probably quite deliberately using the the, the inconsistencies in the social media platforms positions to to show what a ludicrous situation it is so in a way i think he is using censorship to to demonstrate the the situation and what he considers capture of all of those platforms i think that's definitely the case um i think we as content creators should always be very clear about what what potential traps we can all fall into. And I feel much more confident in creators when they do that. Like it is a powerful narrative. The censorship thing is a powerful narrative. Like I've thought about when I think about kind of the right way to have the conversation around say Pierre Corey or some of these people who've been boosted off YouTube, I think, okay, if I, what's a, what do I think is a journalistically defensible way to have that conversation that we'd have Corey in dialogue with someone else like that I think because I think there's a really difficult position when you conflate two issues the one issue is we should be able to discuss these topics and I think that is completely defensible we should be able to discuss them if you then as a host cross over to being an advocate for a certain position I think that's a different I think that's a different topic it's a different ethical situation and I have thought, well, if I host a conversation between one of these people who've been deplatformed or whatever, but I do it in a journalistically defensible way, and I'm ba- and I'm banned and I'm censored, I could I could potentially get I think I could get press press pickup for that. And I did, I understand your position, Joshua, but my sense is having having watched the the IDW and the way that so many of them got caught by audience capture, the way we're in a media environments that are designed to weaponize our 
personalities against us and our worst aspects against us and our performativity and our narcissism and all these things that unless we start consciously bringing those into the conversation, we're not going to be able to make sense of the world. I don't think it's enough to, and I think, I think what, yeah, I think what used to be sort of like, this is the data and this is ad hominem. I think that has completely collapsed. Um, so I think we need new rules of engagement. And I know, I know where you're coming from, but I, I don't think it's sufficient in this new media environment to have that division. David, it seems like you're, 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 you're pretty at home with the idea that we should look at uh, narcissism and audience capture as a as a, an explanat an explanatory mechanism for the behavior of people who've gotten fame, but less willing to look at the the behavior of people who have billions of dollars at stake. You just want to be, you seem to say earlier that you just want to believe that people are closer to angels. And that that you don't think that the economic forces are strong enough to to prevent this kind of convergence on consensus for shutting down certain narratives and privileging other ones, and I, and I wonder why. And no, that no I don't think I've said that, Max. I okay. think I've been quite clear all the way through, saying we need to be aware of these vast corporate interests and be suspicious about their influence on the narrative. Okay. I, what I'm suspicious of is is total capture. I think yeah. there's always there's always way of appreciating like I mean there are certain perspectives around like the use of anti-psychiatric drugs that I think there's a var been a vast conspiracy for a very long time about not being honest about the effects of those drugs and that but there are for example Robert Whitaker the award-winning I think Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who exposed that like there are credible people um I think you can always for me, the truth generally pokes through. What I don't believe is in total capture, but I think you have, you have to be wary. I don't either. I don't either. I yeah. I just I'm willing I'm willing to look at it much like Brett as a strong, um, ex explanatory feature of these phenomena, and I, I I guess you do agree with that. Yes. Okay. okay. The idea that we don't have total capture, the phrase total capture, suggests a binary that isn't relevant. It's not about total capture or total lack of capture. It's capture in degrees, and we're significantly captured in public health authorities are significantly captured by the industry they're supposed to be regulating. It doesn't have to be total capture. Sure, but I don't think that... I think we have to adjust the assess these in context, and my argument would be, personally despite all of the vast forces that are in favor of vaccinations, I don't see that happening in this case. The way that what happened with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine, both of which were withdrawn after a very small number of adverse events. What I'm saying is I don't believe the narrative that there are these huge numbers of adverse events and it's just the, the monetary capture of the system. Like I think there are these forces, but also I think the health authorities are genuinely paying attention to the negative influence of the vaccines. I don't think there are this hidden sort of high, highly dangerous after effects that are not being flagged up. I think I think there are systems that are doing their job pretty well, which is why we saw the Johnson & Johnson vaccine being withdrawn, the AstraZeneca vaccine being withdrawn. That's a great point. I think that's richly open for debate, whether we're doing a good job of collecting the data. To me, that's one of the best criticisms. Like, I don't have a strong feeling about whether the vaccine is safe, but I have a strong feeling about whether we're capturing the data well enough and making that data available to people. I think the incentives that are in place right now are aligned around doing a poor job of capturing that data so that we actually can't make clear decisions when it comes time to make a cost benefit analysis. Um, but I'm not really prepared to make that argument. It's just something that seems clear to me over and over is the data that we're collecting is not as good as it should be. Well, and I I, I wanted to, to to take up for David for just a moment on this idea of, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I was pretty disappointed at the FDA putting a pause on that when, when it did. And it was only for a couple of weeks or something. And they they took it back because the the, the data suggested that the incidence of blood clots or whatever were relatively small relative to the potential impact of the drug. And I think everything was 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 pretty hunky dory after that. At least that's the narrative. Um, and and yet 
there was a precipitous decline in vaccinations after that Johnson and Johnson pause. And it, it spooked people to a very high degree. So on the other hand, you know, and I was just talking about behavioral control and manipulation. On the other hand, if you were going to, be, you know, manipulate people into getting the vaccine, the last thing you should have done is put, put a pause on Johnson and Johnson with those low numbers of adverse effects or apparently low numbers of adverse effects. Um, so I'm contradicting myself in a way and, and sort of saying, I get where you're coming from, David, and I want us to be um, fair minded with respect to the, the apparent behavior of the regulatory agencies. This was a, a, a trial event to to kind of see whether we could make sense a little bit together. I mean, it's a, we'd love I'd love to hear any suggestions of better ways to do this. Obviously, I think uh, having having some medical professionals in, involved as well is a way of doing it. Um, and I also wanted to kind of bring everyone up to date on what's been going on behind the scenes and what I've kind of been trying to wrestle with uh, over the over the last few uh, days and weeks. And I, I yeah, and I, I hope that it's been useful. And I also hope that um, people can maybe suggest way, ways of making it more useful in the future, because I think that I think we are um, all groping in the dark to some degree and um, trying to kind of light each other as much as possible. And I really want to thank, thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everyone, putting forward the questions and look forward to seeing you again soon at another event. Thank you, David. And take care. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you everyone. You're welcome to unmute yourself and say thank you and goodbye. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So much. much appreciated. Thank you, very, very right. thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.